Recently, there was a fire alarm in my dorm. I was sitting in the dining hall, totally unprepared, but I immediately got up, I uh, incited my friends to join me, and I left for the exit. Nobody followed. My friends were saying, oh, it's just another exercise, they'll shut it down soon, or not again, I'm eating. It took minutes before the building was eventually evacuated, and it turned out that there was only some smoke, but I couldn't help but wonder, what if there were a real fire? Would my friends have been trapped because they were still arguing about the authenticity of the alarm? I think many parallels can be drawn between this incident and climate change. The alarms are there, the solutions are there, but nobody is moving. Now, our climate is a very complicated system. And in that system, CO2 acts as a thermostat. A thermostat we have been putting very high recently. I say we because we are responsible for the CO2 level in the atmosphere. We can do something about it, and I think it's our moral obligation to act upon it now. CO2 is a waste we have been dumping in the atmosphere for way too long. And we are dumping a lot. Worldwide, 30 billion metric tons per year are dumped into the atmosphere. Now, do you know how much you are contributing to this? Well, personally, I didn't know it either in the beginning, but the average American is emitting some 16 metric tons per year. That is the weight of 16 family cars and more or less the volume of this room. But it is very hard to imagine how that small number eventually scales to that enormous number of 30 billion. What is even more difficult to imagine is how measures a single person takes influence that enormous number. So say, for instance, that average person wants to reduce his emissions by half by installing solar panels on his rooftop. This would save eight tons per year, but what will it do to the total emissions? So I think it's clear that we just need to think bigger. And the number that might come very close to our total emissions is the CO2 emissions from the US electricity production. That number is 2 billion metric tons per year. It's almost half of the total emissions. Why do we want to look at that number? Because most of the electricity in the US is produced in big coal and natural gas-fired power plants. Now, those are very stationary, big sources of CO2. And the idea is to take out the CO2 from the exhaust gases and to store them in reservoirs under the ground, which you could see in blue. Now, the problem here is that the exhaust gases not only contain CO2, that's only 5 to 15 percent, that's the red and uh, brown, it also contains nitrogen, that's the blue molecules you see there. And that is where carbon capture, the part of my title, kicks in. And that is actually the reason why I'm currently on a Fulbright at Berkeley. I'm looking for materials that can selectively remove CO2 from exhaust gases. And you have to picture these materials much like sponges, only some 10 to 100 million times smaller. Now, at that very small scale, what you would see is that the nitrogen molecules in blue are a bit bigger than the CO2 molecules in red and brown, and so it's harder to get into the pores. And you would also see that CO2 interacts more strongly with the material than does nitrogen. So if you bring this sponge in the exhaust gases, this sponge will soak up the CO2 and just let the nitrogen go through. Now, once that material is full, you can easily regenerate it. That's a what I call kitchen chemistry. You can indeed just squeeze the sponge and the CO2 will again come out. Or you could also heat up the material. And now you can think of a way to implement that in the power plant. Now, there are hundreds of materials that are already known that could do this trick. And now I'm going to tell you a little secret. Actually, I never made any one of those materials because I am a computational chemist. For my PhD, I try to model chemical reactions and predict chemical properties by uh, solving chemical and physical equations like these. Now, luckily, I don't have to solve these equations by hand. Supercomputers can do this trick. The advantage of the supercomputer approach is that it's actually pretty fast. Once you think of a material, you can insert the structure in the computer, run the simulation, and in a matter of minutes, you'll know every property of that structure. You can see some structures on the top of the slide. 
and you can correlate the properties of that material. Now, this is very practical because you can uh, scan hundreds, thousands, or even millions of hypothetical or known materials for their CO2 properties and then select the best one and focus your experimental effort on those materials. Now, what is the best material? Uh, the best material can be uh, several points. You want a sponge that soaks up a lot of CO2. You want a sponge that doesn't take in any nitrogen. You want a sponge that preferably isn't too expensive. You also want a sponge that you can easily squeeze. And uh, while well, all these factors determine the best material. Now, I've touched to the uh, cost of this process. Of course, well, unfortunately, carbon capture is not free. And uh, well, now I'm going to the dollar side. Actually, my professor at Berkeley recently said, Leonard, you are not a chemist. You want to reduce everything to dirty dollars. I'm not sure whether I should take it as a compliment or not, but anyway, uh, here it comes. So as I said before, uh, the US electricity production is emitting 2 billion tons of CO2. And it is estimated that CO2 capture, carbon capture, uh, will cost around $40 uh, dollars per ton. This sets the total price tag to a staggering $80 billion. But if you compare this to the possible effects of climate change, say a hurricane like Katrina, the total property damage after Katrina was $81 billion. But of course, the real tragedy of this natural disaster were the 1,803 fatalities um, in that incident. And I think this really puts the whole price tag in perspective. Now, you may think that carbon capture is some futuristic matter, but actually it's not. Carbon capture is ready today. We only need to take the initiative. Now, going back to the alarms of climate change, um, I think they will continue to sound very hard in the future, whether it's the rising sea level, melting land ice, hurricanes, tornadoes, or droughts. What I do hope is that a strong politician will stand up from the dining table and say, yes, we capture. Thank you. Thank you.